Welcome back to another Before You Read lecture. This lecture is on Genesis chapters 25 through 36. Now these chapters in Genesis really continue that extended family narrative about Abraham and his many offspring. The section opens with Abraham marrying yet another woman named Keturah and having children with her. This is followed quickly by a brief mention of Abraham's death and a list of the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son through Hagar. With that, the story shifts focus again, this time tracing the lineage of Isaac, Abraham's son through Sarah. If you recall, Genesis 24 contains a long description of the courting and marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. We get a short recap in the middle of Genesis 25. Genesis 25 says that Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah. In verse 21, we learn that Rebekah, like Sarah before her and so many after her, is barren. But Isaac prays to God and Rebekah is able to conceive and she gives birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. Stories of their rivalry and exploits take center stage for much of this part of the narrative. You probably remember certain parts of the Esau-Jacob saga. Maybe you remember Esau's fatal decision to sell his birthright to Jacob for a cup of soup. Or you remember the, the time when Jacob tricked his, his father Isaac into bestowing on him the blessing reserved for the firstborn Esau by putting animal fur on his arms and pretending to be his brother. In any case, after Isaac dies, things get so bad between the twins that Esau determines to kill Jacob, which sends Jacob fleeing for his life. Now. Even though Esau doesn't take up the bulk of the, the, of the narrative, there are some subtle but important details about Esau that fit some of the theological convictions of Genesis. Esau is not only denied his privilege of being firstborn and therefore the next sort of leader in the tribe, but because of the, because of the, the situation, he also marries a Canaanite woman. And by doing so, Esau effectively seals him, himself off from the promises of Abraham and Abraham's offspring. And so because of, because of Jacob's trickery and because of Esau's marriage, really that becomes a, another civilization, another family group that is independent of God's purposes to, uh, or God's purposes with, uh, with Jacob. Much of Genesis 28 through 32 focuses on Jacob. In Genesis 28, 10 through 12, Jacob has a dream in which God applies the promise first made to Abraham to him. God promises that Jacob's offspring will be like the dust of the earth and that through them all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. Of course, for this promise to be fulfilled, Jacob must have a female body to produce the offspring. Now, I have spoken very crudely and directly on purpose. The, per the perspective of Genesis in this portion of, of the book, at least, is very androcentric. God's promises are made to men in the story, and they are fulfilled by the birth of male children. Women are treated as little more than short-term incubators of this male-centered promise. And we can see this clearly in the stories related to Jacob's wives. Yes, plural. In Genesis 29, Jacob meets his cousin Rachel at a well. And after some back and forth, he enters into a financial agreement with his uncle and Rachel's father, Laban. Instead of paying the typical bride price, he will work for seven years for his uncle Laban so that he can marry Rachel. But Laban tricks the trickster. He gives Jacob his older daughter, Leah, instead of Rachel. 
So Jacob determines that he will work another seven years so that he can marry Rachel as well. Who knew that the TV show Sister Wives have support in the Bible? Now, the sibling rivalry between Esau and Jacob is mirrored by that of Rachel and Leah. The two vie for his attention and they try to prove their worth to him by, you guessed it, bearing children. At first, Rebecca is barren, but Leah is able to have children. And then Leah's baby maker is temporarily turned off, and eventually Rebecca's is turned on. Along the way, both women give their female slaves to Jacob to father children in their place. The stories of one of these four women becoming pregnant and giving birth can easily blur together. But here's the important thing to note. The 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel come from four different women, two of whom are slaves given willingly or unwillingly to Jacob for the purpose of making more babies. My guess is that this is rarely talked about in Sunday schools. It's rarely talked about in sermons but it's an important detail for us to notice as we read this portion of Genesis. Another focus of this part of Genesis is Jacob's financial success. Jacob continues to work for his uncle Laban, but eventually Jacob leaves Laban with all of the best of his flock and his family. According to Genesis 30, 43, Jacob grew exceedingly rich and had large flocks and male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. After a little mishap with some household gods, Laban and Jacob reach a covenant agreement and basically part ways. At this point, Jacob turns his attention to his estranged brother Esau. While Jacob fears that Esau's anger toward him has not yet abated, the two eventually meet and are reconciled together. Despite their early, earlier rivalry and the fact that Esau neg effectively sealed himself off from God's covenant to Abraham, both brothers have prospered greatly. A world of scarcity is turned into a world of abundance. The world is big enough for both Jacob and Esau. There are other details in this section of Genesis that I hope you will notice. More encounters between Jacob and God's messengers. Another tragic story related to the value of women in comparison to that of men. And many more details about sibling rivalries and Jacob's trickery. So, what should you pay attention to as you read? There's a number of things that I would encourage you to be on the lookout for. First, pay attention to the theme of blessing and promise, something that started really with the Abraham cycle but continues all the way through this portion of Genesis. Notice who is blessed and who is included in God's promises, as well as who is not blessed or not included. What does it mean or what does it look like for someone to be blessed in this section of Genesis? Second, read the stories about Jacob carefully, even critically. What kind of character is Jacob? Are his actions honorable or moral or, 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 or worthy of imitation? To what extent does the narrative validate his trickery? Third, consider points of connection between the stories you read in Genesis and your own life. Is it easy for you to make these connections or is it difficult? In what ways do the stories of the Bible intersect with your own life? Finally, don't forget to notice what's going on inside of yourself as you read this portion of Genesis. It's very likely that you will notice new details about the text, some of which may be surprising or even troubling. What reactions are you experiencing when you read stories about sister wives, birthing slaves, and even rape? How do you regard the pers per perspective that is offered in these chapters about what 
counts as God's blessing and what, by, in, by indication, indicates the opposite. I'm guessing that you will have a lot to think and even write about as you engage this section of Genesis. Now, get reading. Thank you.